welcome to Reality NSFW's coverage of Survivor 42, Episode 8, I believe. The, who knows what the numbers are? This is the Deep Dive Podcast. I am your host, Alex Arino, joined, as always, by my amazing co-host, Dan Monchel. Dan, how are you? I'm doing great. You know, I'm really happy with the way the season's going so far. All right. Nice. At least some positivity. Don't think here. I jinxed anyone on our last podcast either, so it's first. You'll, you'll jinx someone next week. All right. And our very special guest today is someone we have we had on last season, one of my favorite people to talk Survivor with from Survivor Guatemala, the one and only Brian Corden is here. Brian, how are you? I'm great. Welcome uh, welcome me, I suppose. I don't know why we welcome you, but I'm happy to be back and happy to talk Survivor. <laughs> Do whatever you, welcome whoever you, you want. Know, you know what? Welcome, welcome to me. How about that? Yes. Welcome to you. <laughs> All right. First question. How have you been? What have you been up to? Oh, you know, life, COVID, a lot of pandemic. I don't know, knows, whatever. New York's New York's great. Come to New York, everybody. New York's doing great. Um, SAT stuff is busy. That's my job. And SAT's changing in 2024. So now we've got to like re-update all our materials and it's going online. And I have a very tech savvy, tech non-savvy boss. So that's fun. But you know, we're all we're all just going through it. Nice, nice. Thoughts on Survivor 42 so far? It's a great season. Great, 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 good, fun, great. It might be strong. It's not like cocking yeah. on, but it's better than last season, right? Like last season, I felt like we were just also happy to have Survivor back that maybe we were kind of willing to overlook some of the more grating personalities or annoying twists. And this season, I feel like everyone's pretty much bringing it, I think, right? Yeah. I think we're definitely get it from getting it from a lot of these players. I also think one thing that's a little different is the editing has been more balanced. I still can't tell you a thing about Lindsay, but other than that, I feel like we know a good deal about everyone. I feel like I'm a Lindsay apologist. I, I like Lindsay. I think is one of my favorites, and I know that's like weird from an editing standpoint, but I just feel like I got a good vibe from Lindsay. Oh. I like, I like her coolness. I think uh, the little we've seen of her has been good, and I think she's amazing in challenges and gets. Very little credit for that because Jonathan steals the show, and rightly so. But, uh, you know, like in this episode, they both uh, started that challenge for their respective teams, and she was right there with him the entire time. So I feel like Lindsay's not getting enough credit, especially in the athletic department. Uh, Yeah, I think, you know, if you're really paying attention to it, and maybe you have to look for the little things, but you see where she shows up. Like you mentioned the challenge, and I feel like even earlier on it was, well, it was Jonathan and Omer that were together. But I think if you really paid attention, it seemed like it was more Lindsay was part of that as a threesome rather than it just being the two of them. So I think she does kind of, she's in a good spot. We're just maybe not seeing it as much. Yeah. I think Lindsay's pretty well ensconced in not only that alliance of eight, but in that kind of sub alliance with Omar and uh, Jonathan. And uh, even though Roxroy randomly threw her a vote, last week, uh, which by the way, never got explained at all. I thought he's part of the eight. So why did he vote for Lindsay? Unclear, uh, not a great job from a narrative standpoint of letting that one go. But uh, I think Lindsay's, Lindsay's on no one's radar. Yeah, including most viewers, I suppose. I mean, this makes two weeks in a row that we get a rogue vote spelled completely incorrectly. <laughs> and I thought it was Roxroy. I really did. I was like, yeah. like, I was like, why is Roxroy voting for high this time? And then I see the votes like oh it was romeo i guess that makes sense but why well does it make sense like it makes more sense to me that he would have no clue what's going on than roxroy that's absolutely true but like why high again just like i guess these these rogue votes are so inconsequential to the season and this is not new to survivor 42 or even 41 they've been doing this for you know since the beginning this like random rogue vote comes in and the editor is just like and we'll never talk about it again and you're just like Okay, so I mean, like, I feel like I can put two and two together, but like, why high? Especially when the only relationship we know between Romeo and High is that they bonded over their shared, well, actually, kind of not shared LGBTQ plus experiences last week. So, kind of a little strange. You sort of have to read between the lines to feel like, okay, I think Romeo just doesn't like High, despite that superficial connection they have. I, so I don't know. I think it could. I yeah. I think it could be something personal, just like the way I was talking to him, telling him what the plan was, and hey, like you're good, you're good, you're good. Maybe he thought like I was plotting against him. Yeah. I don't know, but I think 
we've seen when the rogue vote has like an impact, like Chanel's rogue vote did with Mike still. Well, right. Yeah. So I'm giving them that, but I also think we're seeing a lot more of the rogue votes nowadays mm-hmm. than we were. Because in the past, like you'd get the you'd get one or two and we get Rupert screaming all hell is loose of who voted for me, who voted for me. How great was that? How great was that? Man, Pearl Island is a good season. Man, I oh, I miss it. Yeah, I, I don't think you're going to have high coming back to camp and, uh, you know, bitching up a storm. I kind of think we are. I don't oh, think really? I, I don't think I would call high not petty. <laughs> that, that's a good way to put it. I, yeah. I like that. Not like I think that high and I, you know, was reading some of Chanel's exit interviews and obviously hearsay, but she was saying that high was kind of intent on having a perfect game. Who knows if that's true, but certainly this would ruin that having a single vote against him at this point. Um and I don't know that High has shown himself to be somebody I would trust emotionally, uh, I if like, I can put it that way. I, I don't know. I feel like I get this, like, sometimes I get this energy from High that I'm like, God, you just, you seem a little petty. And I don't know. I would not be surprised if he's not out. To, I would be surprised if he's not out for Romeo after that. I mean, I, I think you could say that with a good amount of these people that, like, they're a little, in, in terms of the game, a little emotionally unstable where you can't wrong them. And they're like, oh, okay. Like, they seem very game body and, like, very focused on the game. And then that would make you think, oh, they'll be able to get past a rogue vote or something. Right. But these players are, like, just like, no. This is the little bit of mistrust that I need. And now you are dead to me. Well, weird coming from Mike of all people, right? Uh, Mike doesn't strike me as the kind of person who would have been so I vindictive, get- but... Especially given that he voted for Chanel at that exact central council for pretty much the exact reason she voted for him, which is to kind of safety net against a potential shot in the dark or idol. Yeah, I mean, I think it's what I expected was the like Mike being like, I'm not loyal to her anymore. And like the trust being broken. I don't get the like, I need her out immediately. Yeah, it was a hill to die on for him, which was a little strange. I mean, I get like. If you're going to vote out someone, might as well vote out the person who you know in the past has voted against you. Yeah. But to be so vehement about it was a little like... And even in the past, just the, that episode when it happened, or the, the subsequent episode, when at the start of this episode, they're coming back to camp and Chanel wants to talk about it. And Mike says, like, well, I'm you know, not really over it in a confessional. And it was just like, what? It's a rogue vote that she did because she had to do. And I guess he felt like why her rather than Lydia or Daniel, but, like, why not? I don't know. I, I, I For some of her character, I like a lot, and I like I do like Mike a lot. I did feel like that was a mark against him, that kind of sensitivity to a vote that actually made a lot of sense. Mm. I, I get the being concerned of it, because, like, at least for me, I'd look at it as, oh, okay, it wasn't your first choice, but I was still, like, you still thought, like, I'm expendable to you. And I probably wouldn't work with her with the same level of trust that I would before, but I would be faking it and being like, oh, what happened? Oh, the, uh, okay, sure, we're good, and move on. Yeah, it's but just like back- a lot easier to take that argument if he hadn't also voted for her at that exact tribal council. Did he? Yeah. I mean, he did, didn't he? Am I wrong about that? Yeah, no, you're right. He voted yeah, for he her. Did. Okay, so- yeah, so it's like, okay. I just I think it's like Mike is so... I think it's maybe the old school part of him, like the old school and loyal part of him where he's like, I know the plan. Here's the plan. Here's what's happening. Oh, something didn't happen according to plan. Oh, I could have gone home, gone home because this one person decided to go not according to plan. Crap. Yeah. I mean, I just, I think I'm like so painfully logical and so completely unemotional that that kind of hypocrisy to me is just like, well, I can't work with this at this point. Like I, if you're going to, Unless I'm, and you know, obviously as viewers, we see so little and blah, blah, blah. And there's so much more. But from the story we're being delivered, it's very weird how he reacted compared to how she reacted. Because she was never part of his plan anyway, really. Like, what was what was the plan in his mind then is, all right, guys, the four of us, we have a plan. We're going to vote out Daniel. Everyone vote for Daniel. But, you know, I'm going to vote for Chanel. <laughs> and then, like, Chanel didn't do the plan. Well, because she knew the plan when she's the backup. Like... Uh, I think you can get a lot of that maybe for more of the old school or whatever is, well, you lied to me and they're able to overlook. Yeah, I lied to you, but it was different. And I just think some people can't quite mm-hmm. look at it logically, maybe like yourself. 
despite the fact that it's pretty cut and clear out there. It seems it. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I it may to me is also a little bit of a black mark against Chanel and not like the rogue vote because she had to do it. I completely get that. Maybe like knowing the person you're voting for. And I feel like obviously we don't see that much on screen. So I think we were a little surprised with how vindictive Mike is and how much, but they know how much he, vo- they all should know how much he vo- values loyalty being out there for what I think, what was it? Day like eight, 10 at some point when yeah. that happened mm-hmm. and knowing, all right, who can I vote for? And part of it is like, all right, who could I, would I be willing to sacrifice? And I get it being Mike from that perspective, but I think you also have to think in the perspective of this is about self-preservation he more than li- more likely than not, we are both. Hopefully, we are both uh, going back to camp together. Who can I smooth this over with? And I almost feel like Mike has to be your last option. Well, I think that's a good point. I, I, I think basically knowing your audience and who is going to take this vote the most reasonably probably should have been Lydia, I guess, from that standpoint. Yeah, I, yeah, probably Lydia would have been a good one. Yeah, the only other thing I can think of is so, you know, with their first tribal council, Jenny goes. And so it's Mike comes back. He's, you know, still there, but maybe unsure of where he stands. And at that point, it's just more important to make him feel like, no, Mike, you're no, you're in no danger. Like you're in with us. And I think maybe that's just what he needed at that time was he needed to feel like, okay, I'm in with the group, with the majority. I'm not going home. I'm not, you know, the backup option. Yeah, I mean, I, it's just hard to fault any backup option for then creating a backup option for themselves. Like, yeah. and that's yeah. sort of what happened with Romeo this week when Romeo, Romeo was like, "No, I," and then like everyone's calling him paranoid, you know. And you're like, "Well, well he wasn't paranoid <laughs> because he correctly assessed that he was getting votes." So when a backup vote realizes they're the backup vote. I guess the idea is, God, you can't, you just don't want people to know they're a backup vote, but in a tribe of four or it was five, five, five at that point. Five time, five at the time. I guess it's hard to hide who a backup vote will be, but for yeah. Romeo this week, since we are, I guess, talking about this episode. Yeah. Um, yeah. For Romeo recognizing that he's a backup vote and then freaking out about it. I don't know what his plan was other than freak out about it, but it obviously didn't go super well. <laughs> I mean, I think in this instance, I think you can both say he was paranoid and had an idea of what was going on. Because I, I think he was, he, I agree he was paranoid and he showed it. That's like, I think the big thing of, he showed that he was concerned. And I think he also maybe was thinking, not knowing if he's the backup target or the for, or the first target. And I think he was almost playing as, okay, my name is out there for all I know. I could be going home. Like, let even if I'm not the backup, let me just do what I can. And I think he, we pretty clearly saw he overplayed. And I'm, would you, do you think Mike be, was the difference that saved him? Because it seemed like I was ready to go on board, just be like, screw this guy, I'm done. It does seem like Mike's vendetta against Chanel is probably what saved Romeo, unless anyone was really fighting for him. But even Drea from his previous tribe sort of dropped him pretty quickly after the merge as far yeah as that that thought. that surprises me i don't know what it whether it says more about the way kind of a player drea is or the kind of a player romeo is and how are the two of them not working together like immediately yeah i don't i mean drea sort of quickly found herself better allies and we didn't get a great explanation of how that dissolution happened between them and suddenly romeo's just on the outs despite really never even having been in trouble in the first half of the game and now all of a sudden he's out i mean i guess he's still above tory it's just that tory's been winning immunity but i i guess drea saw an opportunity maybe maybe at some point the alliance is too big right i mean there's 12 of them there and that alliance uh, was once what, eight people it was eight people yeah, yeah the alliance eight. was eight people when it included lydia so i i guess at what, at what point are you like all right well you have an alliance of 10 people so maybe dre was just saying you know count me in let all i'm willing to cut ties but, with them if i'm in but this she group. included roxroy that was the thing yeah true I, I think the reason for including roxroy is because where's roxroy gonna go we, we haven't really seen him as you know this strategical mastermind and so if she feels like hey he's a number with me and he's already shown that you know he wouldn't vote for so what you know he kept voting for tory despite the fact that you know he was left in the dark that mm-hmm. he isn't gonna differ and come up with his own his own genius plan 
So yes. why not take the number that I know is with me rather than someone like Romeo, who maybe is a little bit more game savvy and may find a way to operate outside of what's best for her. Although then Roxroy votes for Lindsay, that travel council. I, I didn't say it was a perfect theory. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. You could say nothing with Roxroy is a perfect theory because his game is so all over the place. You're like, okay. Well, he's admitted on several occasions to his credit that he's not really a social player. I mean, Roxroy is content to be on Exile Island. He'll build a shelter. He'll survive the elements. He'll handle all the aspects of the game that are kind of more physical and maybe mental. Fine. But the social aspect seems not his his ball game at all. I, I mean, it's so not his game. I still remember Zach's exit interview. What was the best part of Survivor? Oh, the 30 minutes Roxroy went off for a confessional. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah, I was like, it, it, for someone's, I don't think Zach was saying it vindictively. It was just, my, well, he was he was a buzzkill. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine. I mean, we we saw some of that earlier on too. How Roxroy is all about. We need a shelter. We need the survival aspects. We need the bare necessities. We have to get things done, and uh, that's could, obviously true. You do need that stuff. And a player who's more into the game, the game, 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 is not going to be in love with that. So I get where Zach and Roxroy would not have been compatible. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, he didn't do a very good job of hurting cats, but he's still here somehow. But I mean, we, we start with this ep episode. I, we go from Mike talking about who's on the outs and like the four people, uh, Tori, Chanel, Romeo, Marianne. And then we go to just who's mad at who. And Chanel's up mad at high. Because how does Mike know and not me? I still love that. Right. That game. And then Romeo's mad at Dre. It's like you didn't tell me. She's like, Mike told you. Well, no, no, Mike didn't. Mike doesn't get to tell me. You have to tell me. He's like, and then, yeah, and then Dre is like, no, Romeo is going for most, my number one ally to most paranoid. I'm just like, that's interesting. If he really was your number one ally to just send him aside like that, like, I don't know. Well, it's a messy game, right? This season feels, it's messy. I don't feel like that's an understatement. Clean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So you don't have a clean group of uh, eight. I mean, I guess we have this group of eight, but even within that group of eight, it's not, it doesn't feel strong and it's also way too big to sustain. Yeah, I mean, we've First got all, we're already at 10 people, so yeah, we have seven of the final 10 in that group. Yeah, um, oh, right, because we lost Lydia from it, right? So it's, yeah, and then you just have Tori who's winning immunity all the time, Romeo, who is the paranoid crazy person, and Marianne, who has an idol somehow, right? Right, but not for long though, maybe. I think she's gonna use it. Well, either that or oh, or that it'll be stolen. Yeah, do we want to go? Do we want to go there? I know it's jumping around, but do we want to talk about the advantage that I hate? You hate the knowledge of power advantage. I hate it. Oh, go on. I'm curious. vehemently hate it. Okay. So that's twice we've used vehement today. SAT teacher keeping track. Good. You know what? <laughs> maybe maybe I'll take your class again. I don't know. <laughs> Even though I'm about to graduate college, but you know what? Still, you no, know, it can hurt. Vocab. It's useful. Yes. All right. So uh, the the simple so the. Drea finds the beware advantage at the challenge, uh, which is the first time Jeff broke the fourth wall this episode. She finds it because she's a little bit observant. Thank God. Uh, but I like the clue there. Like, it's near the water well. The risk is the ease of getting caught red-handed. And I remember when I saw it, I was like, that's the beware? You just yeah. can get caught easily? And then she, like, sticks her hand in a bucket of red paint. Like, which is fantastic. That's good. I like that. I do that love a good wordplay. So I was very into that twist, yeah. I like the wordplay. I like the fact that there was legit red paint. But then we get the knowledge power. So it's simply put, you ask somebody if they have an idol or advantage and they have to give it to you and they can't lie about it. God, the only way this twist didn't flop last season is because everybody knew about the advantage being in play. Right. Uh, I hate this. And she's too powerful already. She's literally pulling out things. Like, I don't think she's the most like, decorated player we've ever had. And she's smart, too. She's yeah. she's Has she told anyone about anything? She has, yes. The extra so vote almost everyone knows about. And, and the idol, the anyone who knows about the idol will know about. The idol, the only, yeah. the idol Mike and uh, Marianne know about. Well, and Romeo knows, knows too, because they found it together. Uh, Romeo knows that. And, and anyone who knows the phrases, right? Mm -hmm. Which, Which think, assume like, it's just, the, actually, assume it's those four, plus the, th the other three on talk, uh, mm -hmm. Jonathan, plus Jonathan, Lindsay, and Omar, because right. Marianne told them. And, and then, then Hi and Lindsay are going to know about her amulet advantage. Okay. I'm figuring so out. the only thing that's secret right now is the knowledge is power. Tori knows something. Mm -hmm. God, can I just say, what good TV Tori is? She she certainly adds to the season. There's no oh question. 
but yeah. she definitely adds the like you need conflict right a show isn't mm-hmm. good unless there is some sort of conflict and but tori being a thorn in a lot of people's side is 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 good for storytelling She's a thorn in people's sides in terms of just like being a little bit like annoying sometimes, but she's also a thorn in that she knows what's going on. Right. She's and not she a... can't shut up about it. And I love that. Yeah. She, she understands parts of the game really well. And then obviously she's really bad at other parts of the game. I think she understands everything. I just think she just can't execute on certain parts. Well, that's, I, I'm not sure she understands, despite being a therapist, and I'm sure excellent at what she does in her personal life, but there is this disconnect between how she thinks she's coming across and how people are reading her. Or maybe she's well aware that people don't love her. I don't know. I would think she's aware of it. I don't think she likes it, but I think she's aware of it. And it's like, I can't do anything about it. The only thing where maybe she's not being aware, she's the one that's from, you know, small town Arkansas. So maybe she knows, but how often has she really interacted with, you know, all these people that have such different backgrounds. So it could simply just be, it's the first time meeting people, you know, like, Mike or Omer or Drea, whoever it may be, that that could be where a little bit of that issue is coming from. Yeah. Yeah. I, hard to say because I think she did the pageant circuit. So one would imagine she'd get some exposure. There, although I, I, she, I, she I was on Sequester, I know as well. So that gets you something. But I, I don't think many people like Roxford are going to play Sequesters. That seems like a no. <laughs> um, but back to the knowledge is power thing and why I hate it. You can't lie about it. Yeah. The definition of survivor. Yeah. At its core, in every winner, lies, lie, cheat, steal. You can't lie about it. And also, this is after an idol is public. Like these are public advantage. Yeah. The idol is basically public, and now it's oh, go go take it. Like if the only way this twist is to me redeemable, there there are two ways. I, exp- I think I just explained it last. These one is if you get give the play, and this is more complicated. You give the player like a chance to lie, and basically. It's up to the person with the advantage to call their bluff or not. Okay. Yeah. And it's like if you call their bluff and you're right, then you get the idol. Like you can keep it. If say, for example, they just say they have it right away, then you just know about the idol, but they still have it. And if you say no and like they can Are you lie, proving like, that your their bluff has been called? I would say like it would be something like almost like if say Drea asks Marianne, do you have an idol? She says no and basically just says an are you sure or something <laughs> really like a, yeah like, like something like that like legitimately you ask something like that and then it's like all right now marianne has to actually tell the truth Let's and see. if she has the idol it goes to drea if she doesn't then like i don't know you punish drea somehow but that, that way it, it feels like that awesome powers yeah. gig where or uh gag where what, who was it it was it will ferrell or somebody plays the guy who can't lie three times in a row <laughs> or, or you ask him a question three times yes yeah yes or that like... or the other way you can do this the simple way not the big game game show way or the austin powers way is simply tell everyone the advantage exists you don't have to say who has it just say there's some advantage just so you all know uh mm-hmm. when you get an advantage this season you might not want to tell someone because if someone knows they can take it from you I think you almost should have to call your shot with it, like kind of like the idol nullifier or whatever. So you can try to steal someone's idol, but it'd be like because they're playing it that night. Now it's now mine. I almost think that you should have to call it ahead of time, like before going into tribal Mm. to either take their advantage or their idol or something like that. But then, I don't know. I still hate the whole idol nullifier bit because there's no game in that. It's just use the nullifier and whoever you want to go home and they'll have to go home. Um, so yeah, I guess... but I mean, even with that, that's all. I mean, the idle nullifier, all that is based off of results. Like, no one cared in David versus Goliath when it took Dan out. Everyone was happy because, you know, it gave the Davids, you know, some power back in the game. And it only became an issue when it happened to, you know, beloved Janet. I still disagree with that. But you know what? I Listen, I, I was able to say at the time I was happy with the result. But you know what? This is going to be a problem. And it was. Yeah. And I think this is good. We're going to have the same thing. We're going to have season 41. It worked out because everyone knew Liana had it. And then, oh, that was big and flashy and fun. And it was like, who gave the idol to who? And that's fun. But now the players don't know about it. Poor old Marianne's just going to be like, oh, my God. I don't have an idol anymore. Crap. And now Jerry yeah, has I, two idols. I'm going to fall on Alex's side a, a bit more on this one. Because I, I really did hate the Alden nullifier, even when it happened to Dan, because there was no way to guard against that. Exactly. Mm. And when you have, it's this, it, honestly, it's how I feel about the hourglass thing, which is just, but we had it. 
And now you're just making up this fake Calvin Ball rule that says, now I don't have it. I, I, what, what's the point of any of this? Like, we just won a challenge, and now now you're saying we didn't win it. I had an idol. Now you're saying it doesn't count. I had an idol. Now you're saying someone can steal it. Like, what? what's the point? So with nothing's taken for granted. So, oh, I got the most jury votes to win, but you're saying actually this season we're giving it to the person with the fewer jury, vote, jury votes? Like, what? What? What's, what, oh, what can I God. I, sw- I swear Dude, we Just find- for the record, I'm not saying that I'm in support of any of these. <laughs> I was just trying to throw a little like, bit. Like, to clear my there. good name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I'm like, I, I'm knowing you well enough, Dan. I'm like, I know you're not more things, but I swear if they come up with some final tribal council garbage, to put it mildly, and it like, oh, you get to nullify jury votes or something like. I it's just like, no, stop, never do yeah. that. It's just not as fun to play a game when you don't know the rules. It exactly. makes the win a lot less satisfying because the the win, yeah, of course you won by thinking on your feet, but so much of this is so out of your control that you can't plan for it, and you just have to let the chips fall where they may. So ultimately, if you're going to say there's 18 people playing and one wins, someone has to win regardless. So it's not like necessarily I feel like everyone earned the win because there had to be a winner. And when certain people were eliminated for really arbitrary reasons, it's just a lot less satisfying than a winner who was clever the whole way and really knew how to play the game and knew what the rules were and knew how to use those rules rather than having to every day wonder what fresh hell awaits you, which is just a different game. And I'm saying it's, you know, fine. I guess that's a, that's fine. But I personally, as a player, don't find satisfaction in playing a game where the rules aren't laid out so that you can figure out how to work around the rules. So you're telling me you were less satisfied with Bob Crowley winning Gavone than you were with Kim Spradlin winning one world. Uh, less satisfied with Bob winning. Yeah, I liked Kim's win better. How dare you, Destin? No. <laughs> I, I was like, I'm so I'm confused by the question. I was like, are you suggesting I should have been happy with Bob's win? Bob? Yes, of course you should be happy with the guy slipping and falling into a win. Oh, God. Bob. Bob, Bob, Bob. Well, I mean, Bob at least had that fake idol with uh, Randy, which was an uncharacteristic moment of duplicity from Bob. But that whole Gabon season is a disaster. I mean... <laughs> And Charlie's a friend, but that that season is such a such a chaotic mess of weird personalities. And then like the the final six of that season, you could not have picked a more eclectic odd oddball group of people um, to to comprise the final six. Yeah, just the fact that we were one vote away from a Susie Smith win, like that's just like a (laughs) terrible alternate universe. Susie was at the finals for Guatemala. <clears throat> she, I think, was probably, I would assume, up against Lydia. Mm-hmm. And uh, I ran into her. We were at the Dolce in Santa Monica, and I remember seeing Susie in the stairwell. I was going up from lunch. She was coming down to lunch, and we just, like, passed each other in the stairwell and, like, winked. And then You're... I saw her, obviously, three years later on Cologne. Oh, my. I'm just imagining it's a, we get Susie instead of Fishmonger out there. Yeah, yeah. Oh we God. got no, the pancake. Like that. Uh-huh. Uh, that that's one situation where we, we we thank we thank God every day that like they picked Lydia over Susie. Lydia, Lydia's, I need Lydia. Uh, Lydia. Yeah. Lydia's a tribal. Um, anyway, I, how do we get on Gabon? You talked about Kim Spradlin's win. Kim Spradlin was there a lot of ramness in one world? I don't even remember. I feel like she just dominated from he- like beginning to end. That's what I'm yeah, saying. She like won challenges, she was in control of her alliance. She never faced really any risk. She yeah. she handled that season very well. I mean, it, not that that's a good season, but she's a good winner. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> All right, um, but we get a- after the knowledge part. Let's bring it a little bit back. I love that she goes r- and sits right next to Tori, and Tori in five seconds is like thumbs up, which is impressive. I mean, credit where credits due. I-, I don't know how hard it was to notice that red streak, but it was it was a great moment of TV <clears throat> where Tori picks up on it and calls her out on it immediately. That was that was fun to watch in an episode that otherwise had a pretty um, straightforward boot. That mm-hmm. was a good moment. The whole the whole red paint thing was fantastic. I'm unclear why I, I should have rewatched it. So she could see that there was paint in there, right? Before she put her hand in, or I don't. Just... You could see that there was red. Yeah, I'd imagine it because looking down, all you just saw was just red. Right. So I'd I feel like it'd be pretty easy to figure out that it was paint. <laughs> I would. I, I don't. I think she almost like didn't look. She kind of just opened the like. Pushed the coconut aside, saw something, and put her hand in and was like, I want this. Which, to be fair, if I know, like, 
I'm right near the, the well. And there's a lot of people there. I see something in the ground. I'm not thinking there's going to be a pile of blood. I'm think I think there's just going to be like sand. I grab it and I move on. Yeah. And then you're like, oh crap, there's blood on me. And here oh, we go actually, again. It would have been smart if the producers. I, I I'm not sure because that paint looked dense enough that you probably could have sprinkled a layer of sand on top of that liquid paint so that it would look like it was just filled with sand. And then you picked your hand in. And then it turns out you're totally red, which would be great because otherwise, if it looks red from the beginning, and uh, yeah, the, the time component's obviously the problem here. But like, where's this on and all? Maybe that just stuff. like grab a stick or something to wedge it out. But I, maybe but, I mean, I don't think it would. That's something we haven't seen before. So I'm not going in there expecting to be blood. I just expect. Well, I'm just thinking I, if you see a pile of red liquid. Well, if you see a pile, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I also that's think what I'm saying. Like if you cover it, maybe like a, a, a layer of sand or something. Uh, to float on top that that would definitely I, I just i thought it was great i loved the beware aspect of it was like you might be caught right-handed <laughs> like wink uh yeah. okay oh, that was good mm -hmm. wordplay word is fun um let's see what else struck up from the episode i'm looking back early uh we get so we got i think the bad of mike of mike being vindictive and willing to die on the hill of chanel needs to go the good yeah. part of mike him trying to fit in and realizing that he is a 57 year old in a game full of 20 and 30 year olds. We get the, like the, he said he had like a long conversation with Omar about Islam and like his watching and probably trying to like learn from him. And I mean, it worked, it's working well enough where Omar's like, I want to work with Mike the whole game. This yeah. is great. And just, you know, Mike, speaking of Bob, Mike is older than Bob at the time. Yeah. He'd be the oldest. Mm -hmm. oh, if Mike, you were able yeah, to pull it off. Be. But, you you wouldn't expect that. You wouldn't look at them and them playing the respective seasons and be like, oh, Mike's older. Yeah, well, Bob kind of leaned into old physics professor, right? Like bow tie, mm -hmm. white hair, skinny. He leaned into it. I also didn't think he could do anything else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Um, whereas Mike is obviously a very different build and uh, uh, appearance. So, uh, but yeah, but if Mike wins, he's older than Bob at the time. I'm starting to think maybe we could see the oldest winner in Survivor history. Interesting. Which uh, PS would still only be 58, which is not that old. Yeah. Um, we get tree mail being read. I noticed that. I was like, we're reading tree mail? What yeah, is this? First time in quite a while. Yeah. And then I like, and the, I, the reason we read it, because Tori is like, oh, if people are eating, they'll talk more. And I'm like, this is where I think Tori knows what she's, knows what should be happening, but is like kind of thinking, it's almost like if I get the, I think she's thinking if I play a game where I just get the most amount of like points or information, mm -hmm. I win, even though it's kind of like, you don't have to have the most, you just have to at the end have the most, but you can get rid of everyone before who has more, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think that Tori, she understands and she has the, you know, a plan or an idea. It's just her execution on a lot of these things aren't going quite as well. Uh, Tori, I, yeah, I, I don't have <clears throat> much to say about Tori. Um, <laughs> Eliza what? does not like her. <laughs> so what she does have... I, I wonder I why Eliza was, doesn't like her. She's only the second female ever to win the first two immunity challenges post-merge. Uh, after Laura Moret? Yep, who then was immediately voted out after the third immunity challenge. But, All yeah. right. I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Oh, to, well, especially two people. I mean, Tori has to. I, it, it seems pretty clear that Tori has to win immunity or she goes home, particularly because it said in the clip that two people are going home next week. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to get the similar format of last season where it was broken up at 10 to two five on five challenges, whoever lasts the longest. I got to look uh, that up. Who went home last season in that? It was on the one side, that's oh, where they got rid of Nasir. Nasir and, and Evie. Evie, yeah. Oh, okay. Gosh, I wonder how these are going to split. I remember last season I was able to watch the preview and I picked out who was who was on what team and we talked about it, but this time I can't. I also didn't really watch the whole preview, but... um. I had to read again. Okay, so yeah, so we think they're going to do two travel councils of five, is what you're That's saying. That's what they've yeah. pretty much said, right? Okay, yeah. So they do that. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So then, yeah, I mean, Tori. Unless, ben... Tori's, unless Tori's in a group with like High and Romeo. Do you put like High, Romeo? Um, sure. I think the numbers have to work out pretty well for her to stay if she doesn't win. I agree, but I think she has a shot here. It's yeah, awesome. except she's already unliked and she's won two challenges. So that's that's a lot of reasons to vote her out if she's eligible, I, even over potentially. Although I think, yeah, I get like if High is that vindictive about a vote from Romeo, the way Mike was about a vote from Chanel, High could pull rank and say, we'll get I don't know if High is vindictive, but I still think High will just be like, I want Romeo because I didn't get my way last time. Right. I think he'll be like, UPS Mike. hasn't gotten his way either time. He he had to vote out Lydia and he had to vote out Chanel. I think he'll be like, Mike, you got this one. Now we're getting this one. Do what I say. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think this is where I think it can help Tori is if she's in a group with the right four people who yeah. don't all hate her, she has a shot. If she's in a group with she like the four people who dislike her the most, she's done. Like she has no shot now. So that's where I think she also has a great shot at, because it, depending on how the team's fall she oh, has to beat only four people for immunity yeah yeah, yeah she could her... very well win again yeah absolutely mm -hmm. God, i, I kind of love her winning just because it makes everyone on, on the island and it makes i think a lot of people on like in the survivor community just upset and they're just like it, mm, and i kind of love it i just love it it is fun to have an underdog win consecutive immunities that is that's something it's that the we underdog seen villain in a while and i kind of love that even more Everyone wants sure, her. Because you want a villain, yeah. I just, I, I don't know. Yeah. I appreciate the TV aspect of it of that she's there. Even I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Eliza, <laughs> but yeah, she she's good entertainment <laughs> in my eyes. But also, what did you th what did you think of at the reward challenge? Drea's move to swap out with Marianne because it's like I feel like there's two schools of thought. One, it's the good move of being selfless and you look good and all that. But then it's like at this mm -hmm. point. Is it the movie being selfless, or are people just gonna think you did it for your own self, self purpose, so like your own well, plan? Well, they have no reason to expect. I mean, except for Game Changers, when Sarah found the thing that whoever it was didn't notice. Um, it was Michaela. They have no reason, it was Michaela. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I guess they have no real reason to suspect that. Drea is going to benefit at all by sitting out, and she gave uh, a believable enough excuse by saying, well, "I just I don't care about peanut butter and jelly." Well, here's the thing: I feel like even if you don't think there's an advantage there, you have to. I would always. I feel like most of these players are thinking there's a reason you're sitting out, and it's not just to be a nice human being. You want to look nice. You want to benefit yourself in the game some way. And if it's a player like Drea, who I already know is really really good strategically, I'd be like. I, I wouldn't be buying in for a second of like, oh, really? Okay. And maybe she well, does. She said, she said in a confessional, she doesn't like PB and J. There has to be a bit. If if that was the only reason she did it, I'm a little disappointed. She didn't give us any other reason. And she had a yeah. confessional that spoke yeah. to her. I, I think she had to have been thinking there's some advantage. She has to be thinking yeah. some level ahead for yeah. player. I just, I just think ever since, you know, our good friend, Johnny Fairplay, you know, did what he did, that everyone's always going to assume there's some ulterior motive. Back to Pearl Island, is. That revolutionary season. Mm -hmm. I will never, I will never get over Sandra just saying Fairplay's buddy. And again. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're setting him off the plank. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Sandra's great. God, what, uh, what, a, what a good one. Uh, the dream. Um, yeah, so Drea went essentially wins the reward by not winning it. Uh, Jonathan becomes Superman once Roxway doesn't know how to play basketball. Uh, oh, how sad for Omar, too. Uh, after sinking his first four shots, and then he was doing so then he well. Uh, oh, that was so sad for him. He was going to look like such a hero. I mean, he already it was great, he did a fantastic job. And then just to get upstaged by Jonathan coming in there and sinking five so quickly was when he missed one. Point. I'm like, oh no, no, no. Well, no, and I think happen. you could start to tell because you know, these past few episodes, whenever there's a challenge, they give Jonathan the different music. And as soon as it started coming on and when he started making him, I was like, oh, he's they're gonna win. This That's it. Yeah. That music yeah. was a tell. I heard yeah. it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we get the winners of Tor or Tori, Chanel, Roxbury, Mike, and Jonathan. Gotta say, interesting group. We see almost nothing. We see nothing game relevant with them other than the fact that Jonathan eats like a eats like a I don't even know what at this point. Like a superhuman. 
Um, again, because we've heard that three or four times that he's hungry and then he got food, thank God. Um, and then we get on the other end, Lindsay and I are like, that was really good. I don't know if they were acting or not. They seemed somewhat serious that they were actually really proud of everyone. I think so, which, that's why I like Lindsay. I think Lindsay's is, genuine. I think she's legit. I think she's level-headed. Odd. That's odd for a loss, though, to be that, like, upbeat and be real about it and not just be like, oh, that was great, but I'm pissed. Well, I think she was also probably trying to help out Omar not feel so bad about it. Oh, I agree, but she did it in such a way that, like, I'm actually questioning whether she was genuine or not. That's a good thing. Because <laughs> you you're never questioning it. Usually it's like, oh, you were being so fake right now. Stop. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, according to everything that, you know, Jeff says, Jonathan's just, you know, God's gift to survivor challenges. So the fact that they came, you know, within one basket, that's pretty good. He is, Jonathan is God's gift to earth, mankind, and everything in it, according to Jeff. Yeah. Well, that's not a surprise, right? That's Jeff's, no. uh, that's Jeff's kink. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I mean it is. No, so uh, you're not wrong. Funny. I was like, what word are you gonna go with? <laughs> that's really like, that's, a, that's the most accurate one, yeah. I think I think it was the right word. But you know, Jonathan's story about his dad, like make him march up a hill. Everyone's like, wow, that's amazing. I'm like, oh, is it? Or is that like really messed up? I'm like, how old were you? Either wow. you were Did they say he was dad? like three when they'd wake he'd wake him up to start doing pull-ups? Like that sounds brutal. Uh, yeah, that's that's some parental ex expectation mm-hmm. yeah i guess he turned out okay but like i jeez yeah um I, i'm with you there that's um one one person i want to talk about in this is omar mm-hmm. omar managing to be in the the big alliance and then also the way he's working with each person in the minority because he didn't have a vote last time right how long can he keep this up because if he can keep this up long this is phenomenal right this is he, so damn good. So he, yeah, because what's nice about him is it, it doesn't. He's not doing the mistake that Swati made, which was telling everyone you're my number one. So he's just kind of keeping people in the know. And right, who are you going to trust if someone comes up to you and says, "Hey, listen, just like a heads up, I'm hearing your name." Even if they end up voting for you, you feel like, well, at least you gave me the heads up. Like you were on my side. You tried. You just had to go with the majority as opposed to feeling like snaked or lied to. So it really is great jury management, you would think. Uh, As long as he's not promising them anything. As long as, once he starts promising them stuff, then he's going to find himself in a real pickle uh, once he's got to start whittling them down. But if he's just being like, you know, I've been ears on the ground and I heard this, like, like that's a lot less committed. For sure. For sure. All right. So we go from one moment of Jeff breaking the fourth wall to him doing it again, because apparently this is the episode where he just wants to talk to the camera and no one else. Uh, The immunity challenge. And this, I think, to the average fan, probably confused them even more than last year. Um, Watching the way he explained it, I missed a little something. And I'm like, I pay attention pretty, pretty closely. Um, So what he ended up doing was saying you could sit out for an individual portion of rice or. If six people sit out, we'll give you or a number of people sit out. You have rice for the tribe for four days. Right. Mm-hmm. And then I, he has these quotes of like, he's like, if they it's like, I want six, but if they'll go down to four, I'll do it. But then he's like, for your future survivors, history is merely an indicator of what could happen. And then he also just says ridiculous line. I'm like, we're keeping the monster going. The monster could have a bigger appetite next season. Like, yep. why? Why, well, Jeff? I just don't like how he's like, you know, we want six, but we're willing to accept four. And as soon as, you know, they're like, well, we'll give you four. He's like, done. Got it. Like, good to go. <laughs> he's like, you hit the number. <laughs> that was the right one. He was like, pick a number one to ten. Yeah. I still, I, so the negotiation goes like, the tribe says two. He says nine. And then they say three. And I think Omar says four. One person said four and they're all like, shut up, shut up, shut up. I think it was Mike who ended up saying four. Was it Mike? I thought okay. Because I, I thought it was Mike because then maybe I'm wrong, but because then it was Omer that ended up being that fourth to volunteer. Well, it was the four there was three or four, then they got went to three, and then Jeff goes to six, and then they go to four. And this whole thing. And then we have I Demar- honestly stopped paying attention once I realized how stupid this was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I don't blame you. Yeah. Uh, the, the real winner here. <laughs> I'm like writing down numbers that they're saying, and I'm just like, what? I, I lost uh-huh. track somewhere. I like, lost this track. Is dumb. Get there faster. I, I, yeah. That and then we get Marianne begging for something. I was like, "Why are we doing this? Is it kind of like I'll sit out, but don't vote me out?" Like, yeah, I guess it was just a 
Well, she says emotion is a weapon. I'm not sure what she was aiming at. Yeah, <laughs> that I don't one. either. That, that one's one's I'm like, what's your goal? Mm -hmm. Dan, you have any idea? I think she was just trying to go for sympathy. And I don't necessarily know if that was the right play. I guess time will tell. It obviously worked for her in this vote, but that's the only thing I could think of is she was just trying to pull on people's emotions. Fair enough. Um, so we ended up getting Lindsay, Drea, Marianne, and Omer to sit out. And Tori, Allison, you, you paid more attention than I did. Were they getting an individual portion of rice to eat at that challenge or to take back to camp and cook and eat in front of everyone else, which would have been way worse? I It didn't look cooked, so they would have to cook it back, cook it themselves. So it, That's not a reward. That's a punishment. That's that here, guys. Go make rice in front of everyone else and eat it in front of everyone else. That no good comes of that. Well, here's the thing. I don't know if they said that the person has to eat it. If oh, they, they said you the one portion of rice, my guess is they could, people. and it'd be like, all right, everyone gets two grains. Yeah, I, that's like Nalia coming back with a sucked up mint. Yeah. <laughs> Or what they were going to do in Borneo of giving them one whole beer. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. so I, I thought that was weird. I, I, it looked uncooked to me, too, but I couldn't Oh, it was definitely uncooked. I'm almost, yes, I'm, I'm almost certain either way it was uncooked. It was just yeah. how much did you get? Yeah. Okay. But I would have loved them to say, hey, you take the one portion of rice. You, it is only yours. You cannot share it. That is it. That would Even make it that, Like, I, I, it just like I don't think any good comes from eating in front of hungry people. No, no, no. And I think for that, you almost have to do where it's like they reveal the rocks and it's, hey, if you get to this number, mm -hmm. the whole tribe get, you know, you get the bag of rice. If not, whoever decided to sit out, you get your portion. A bit more close to the prisoner's dilemma of do I yeah. do this? Do I not? How many others are going to do it? Yeah. 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 I would, I would prefer that, but no, we can't have nice things. Um, Tori and Jonathan are at the end of it. Tori wins and. Jeff says now that the shot in the dark goes from one and six to two and 12, which is the same math. Yeah, I guess no, theoretically two people could same. be safe at one tribal. Is it happening? Probably not. If that does happen, I call um, a little bit of bullshit. Yeah, I guess because I obviously when he was like, now it's two and 12. And I was like, that's the literal same odds. I, I, I was like, okay, why, why are they saying this? What's the point? And I'm like, okay, I, I think what he means is yes, there are two opportunities to be safe. So, my, but I wasn't even clear last season, like, or even early in this season. If someone picks this shot in the dark and then they pick a scroll, does another scroll get replaced? So the next person, I mean, I guess it's, I a, scroll, it's still it one of six shot. It, it's still either way, right? Because, like, there were six. Someone took one. You're, My, you're still taking one of the six, but you didn't get a chance to pull out. Or if they took it, like, I don't know. I have a lot of questions about the that, shot in the dark. I feel like yeah, that, was that was my thinking, because I thought it was they each had a, If they're each going to have a one in six shot, you replace whatever was taken. But then theoretically, you can get two people get being safe. So my guess, and this is talking out of my ass, is really it's one in six for the first one. They grab one. If they gra No matter what it is, they replace it with a not safe one. So that way only one person can be safe. But I don't know. You're, then you're screwing people who go last, potentially. So, I don't know. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I mean, I guess, are you? Uh, you are if they're safe, and then they're, they're drawing uh, out of six scrolls, and all of them are not safe. Right, because you actually never had the one. Yeah, what they they keep saying a one in six chance, but they don't really mean a one in six chance. They mean one one person out of six. I don't know. I'm, I'm tired. No, I think it literally one. means I think there are six scrolls in there, and there's one that says safe on it. I think they actually mean that. So, but if the person then takes the, let's say the first person grabs the safe scroll, and now they're replaced with an unsafe, the then second person, no. the second person does not have a one in six chance. The second person has a zero chance. I don't, yeah, I don't know that fully, but I, this is also why I love having you because you, we can speculate on this nonsense <laughs> in great detail. I love it. Uh, I, I have no clue. Not a clue in the world. Um, I'll, like if I can every player is supposed to have an energy. equal one in six chance then you have to be replacing it if it was chosen first. Yeah, I would think so, but I just don't know. But if then, of course, really you're going to six people. I mean, statistically improbable. That'd be one over six to the sixth power. But, um, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, at the end of the day, it all just comes down to is, is Jonathan picking the shot in the dark or not? So that's going to, you know, that's a good outcome. Jonathan? <laughs> yeah. 
Because Jeff would be like, oh, no, 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 no. This is, oh. uh, this is the one you want, big guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he's, got like, he's got like, you know, six scrolls here. And Jonathan like goes to grab. And Jeff's like, uh, you know, <laughs> Jonathan's like, uh, this. And she's like, yeah, oh, I can do this one. Yeah. People felt like he did that with um, uh, Deshaun last season with the do or die because there were three. If you watch it, it actually does. And I'm, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist in this aspect as much as I think Jeff sometimes, you know, thumbs the scales a little too heavily. But if you do watch last season, there were the three boxes. Jeff goes like, one of them has fire. Two of them have skulls. And the one that he pointed to actually was the one with the fire. So do that with that what you may. But I, I don't, I think it was random. But yes, it, if you watch, he does actually do that. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, um, I missed that. I, I, I mean, technically, Deshaun made the wrong decision last season. Right, from last the Monty Hall problem, just, you're always supposed to switch. Out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, I'm reading on the Survivor Wiki the rules of Trump work. According to the ex- executive producer Matt Van Wagen, the odds of each player obtaining immunity, regardless of who rolled first or who had already selected a safe scroll, will remain the same. Prior to the merge, the urns contained six scrolls with only one reading safe. When the tribe was merged with 12 players, the number of scrolls increased to 12 with two reading safe to maintain the same odds. The way you described it, that means that more than one person can be safe. Yeah, that's what I would think. And like, I'm still um, disappointed that they have like a six sided die and all they do it is replace it for a scroll. Well, of course, yeah. they, you, you, it's ridiculous, especially. Yeah. Yes. It's, yeah. That's stupid. <laughs> like, yeah. how can we do it probably? <laughs> if only there were a tool where we could use easily to have a one in six chance of getting a certain outcome. Like, yeah. yeah. I also I, love that the way we f- figured out with this was apparently last season, Chrissy tweeted at man Van Wagenen. And asked her, asked him this question because, of course, she did, and he responded. Right, well, she's and, an actuary, so she's going to know her numbers. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so she was like, "How does this work again? Uh, like, if the sh- second person is it now one and five, or are they at a parchment?" Um, says it's no. Although he didn't really answer the second question, he kind of answered the first one of, "Is it now one and five? Now it's one and six. Uh, this makes sense. It's no different than six people picking six rocks. It's still one and six for everyone even though one person picked first <clears throat> are they saying that like then i that th- that last part they still haven't answered i don't think because they're part? saying it's one in six still but if the fir- but i don't think that i think they're still saying that like only one person can be safe well replacement is always tricky when you're dealing with probability but yeah i mean like if you have a bag of six rocks and everyone picks one rock and one rock is you know purple everybody had a one in six chance of getting it regardless of your order because if everyone's taking one of the rocks one well, of the not really I, not, I mean theoretically they did but the, again the person who goes first has the one in six shot but then when you're picking rocks the next person either has a one in five shot or a zero percent shot and so on and yeah so i think it's I like know, I, I know i'm working my way through this i feel like i need to just like write this out because at the one point that sounds obviously totally right but can, I feel like something's missing. Yeah. Brian, can you tweet Matt Van Wagen because maybe he'll respond to you and clarify? No, definitely does not know who I'm. I don't even think he was involved in the show when I was on the show. He probably I, he has to be a big enough fan where he knows who you are. I don't know, dude. I think that he joined after Guatemala. Well, I'm not saying he didn't join, but I'm still fat the fact that he would still know who you are. Like, no, you, maybe. I mean, I, I think at this point we've now discussed it more than the producers did when they were coming oh, that's up with this. Almost twist. definitely <laughs> true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I still, I still remember when it, when Survivor Forty was happening. We got like the inside Survivor cast before we got tribes. I went and made tribes based on like what I thought was fair. And I spent like an hour on it, and I, remember, I think it was like Rob Sisson was like, "You spent more time on this than the producers did," because I was like, "Wait, this one knows each other, and this one played together," and the, and I like I was like, "This is perfect. I've got a list." And I looked at the tribes. I'm like, "Well, they." I thought about. I did think about it more than they did. Yeah, didn't they put Sarah and Tony on the same tribe? Sarah and Tony and Jeremy and Allie, but here's the one thing I will give them for that. And I think it was Adam Klein who said this post game. He's like, every single person pretty much looked at their tribe and thought they were victorious and thought I got a good deal. So if you look at it from that perspective, okay, good. I'll give you that. If you look at it as to me as the, they didn't think this through and kind of got lucky, then not as good. 
She's like, I want to put Jeremy and Allie together. I didn't put Sarah and Tony together. Like, those would have been the two things I would have flipped right away. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, it worked out for one and not for the other. So, and they both had the same playing field in that instance. Right. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've talked way too much about the shot in the dark, and I don't think we'll ever know the answer because um, it doesn't seem like anyone's drawing. Speaking of things we're never going to know the answer to, how do they leave Summit Mountain, Shipwheel Mountain? Like, do you think that's a big ass walk up there? And then obviously, you know, so you turn it this way, I turn it that way in private. Do they walk down together on gag order? Do they walk down separately? Do they walk down and are just told like, you can't discuss what just happened? Like, what is it just like a silent three hour walk down a mountain? What happens? <laughs> that no is idea. the best question that I have no idea. <laughs> like, <Yeah. what? laughs> so you just like leave them at the top of the mountain. You're like, well. Scene over. Anyway, they're back <laughs> at camp now, and you're like, they had to get back. What? There were two of them up one, there. What one, happened? Does it really take three hours, or is it a lot shorter than we than they're saying it is? Because I, I mean, suspect obviously... it takes a while. I, I would suspect hmm. it takes at least forty minutes. I mean, it's not a fifty. My guess would be yeah, in the forty to an hour range, because I also think these players have no concept of time. Also, right? True. Correct. I mean. It, 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 I love uh, players always are saying how long things take. I'm like, how do you have do you any know? concept of time? Right. Yeah. yeah. Other than when the sun goes up and when the sun goes down. Like, what else do you know? You no, know, it was funny when Roxroy was at Exile Island and he was, he told Jeff, he's like, yeah, I was like playing with the hourglass to find out if it's really an hour. I was like, based on what? Do you sit there and count to 3,600? Like, what, the, the, what happened? Certain players, I think, would do that. Roxroy, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I would maybe like see if I can count like halfway down and be like, well, it's halfway full now. And yeah, I guess like set a set a ratio, I suppose. Mm -hmm. That would be my thing, probably. Um, but also, again, we don't yeah. smashing hourglasses isn't a thing, Jeff. To flip them over. The more, yeah, right. The more twists they introduce, the more questions they kind of just assume no one's going to ask. But there are a lot of questions. Like, you know, I know people were kind of wondering why Mike wasn't penalized for delaying his line with the idol at the next challenge right it says in the parchment like at the next immunity challenge you must say this phrase and then he doesn't he decides i won't because i'll keep it a secret that i have the idol until i hear both other teams say it um yeah but then that was just not a thing it, it, that kind of just was like oh no he's fine because now he has an idol and he didn't say the phrase at his first travel council so or uh, yeah th these are the questions that we care about that not enough people do or think yeah. to ask and this is like <laughs> right. where if you have a uh, the dream. Get me a Survivor producer and let me just let's just ask all these questions. Go down the line. And they're like, oh, we didn't think about that. We didn't think about that. We didn't. Think yeah, about that. I think a lot of it is just that, like you know, an unspoken rule in Survivor is ask for forgiveness, Put. not permission. Yeah. Don't ask. Like if it hasn't been explicitly laid out as a rule, just you do it, and then they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. Well, there's so much. There's only so much time in the day when I'm sure the producers are mandated by Jeff that everyone has to stare at Jonathan for four to six hours a day. So. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, then they'll they'll know how much time has passed. <laughs> That's the only way they'll know how how time works out there. Jonathan's their sundial. <laughs> oh, Dan. Um, yeah, I. Like, I feel like I know that, like, the, the players get to like ask Jeff a bunch of clarification questions, like before a challenge or whatever. I, I it would take so much of me to not be that person because I would, I want to know everything. I would be mm -hmm. asking every, like, want to be asking every question in nine ways from Sunday, but I also wouldn't want to be looked at as the person who's asking every single question. I would just be hoping that, that absolutely that. happens, though, especially in challenges. You, you do ask, like, can we do this? Can we do that? Can we do this? Can we do that? Because you, it's just so frustrating to like, do the challenge and then something happens and you stop it halfway through because you're not supposed to do that and then you have to reset it so you do ask a lot of questions before challenge. i bet you do but is like at least when you played was it one person who's asking all the questions or is it like everyone it was often a them? collaborative discussion about okay so can we do this let's check can we do this what about this like okay that's fair because i always feel like if you're the one person who's asking all the questions you're like the teacher's path like can we do that can we do that can we? and everyone else like let's go already yeah like yeah. I think I'm trying and to remember also, any specifics. I mean, there was the basketball challenge. Oh well, that one had a lot of questions about. Did uh, it? What's can that? You, can, can you can you kill each other? <laughs> yeah, well, just like in the uh, Mayan rituals, um, that was the one where Lydia or where Brianna didn't know what a pick was. That question did not arise pregame. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, by the way, I cut my hair, so now you can't say I look like Blake Tassel. I noticed. I I did. I was like, I feel like your hair is shorter. Yes, I. I mean, I, I literally cut it th three days ago. 
mm-hmm. or two days ago at this point. Yeah. So, and then I thought about this morning. I'm like, yes, Brian can't say I look like Towsley. Towsley, <laughs> last name basis. Yeah. No. <laughs> Blake's a good looking guy. That's certainly. I didn't say he was. I didn't yeah. say he was. It was just fun. I still remember the comparison. I was like, just what? <laughs> What I get through me, but you have similar facial features, I think. I, I, I guess it wasn't the hair, yeah. I mean, you I said my hair. Past hair. What's that? My hair was longer, so I think that was part of it. But regardless, uh, I, it, it's not an insult, it's, it, it, <laughs> I just found it funny, and I'm like, I need to counteract that. <laughs> well, it was not the reason I got a haircut, but I was gonna this is so you got a haircut, <laughs> no, but it was an added benefit. Oh, uh, certainly an added benefit. P.S. Is that a is that a cooler cooler buff? Yes, it is. Wow. You were right on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I figure like when they released, I was like, last week I, I didn't get in common time for last week, so I'm like, there, I'll use the excuse I didn't make the merge, and then I got one. I'm like, okay, very nice. I haven't yeah. gotten a buff. Last buff I got, they sent us one. What did they send us one for? Was there a anniversary one? Five hundred like game changer or something. One? It was like, like five hundredth episode. I, maybe I one. think there was one that was. It was right, right around like Winners at War that had all the different logo, every logo like, on it, maybe. That, yeah, yeah, yeah maybe that's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They sent all the players one. That doesn't. I said that. And I was like, "There's no way they did that." So how did I get it? Did someone just give it to me? So yeah, you there's a zero percent chance, a zero percent chance that anyone at the Survivor Corporation looked up everyone's address and sent all the bus. Uh, that's what I'm sounding like. When you said, I was like, Survivor doesn't seem that generous. They are definitely not. So I don't know how that came into my possession. I didn't order it or buy it. Someone must have given it to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. That's a fun fact. All right. So <laughs> we get back to Cool Cool, which I like that it didn't even tell us the name. Was, the episode starts and you just see Cool Cool. I was like, that's the name. Oh, yeah. I was like, wait, no, they had a whole segment about it. No, that was a secret scene. They, that was a secret scene. Secret okay. Scene. Yeah. yeah. Missed it. But did, do either of you know what it means? Yes. What does it mean? It is the, uh, this was the whole secret scene. I uh, missed it, which is why I'm asking the question. Yeah. Omar named it. It's the, the national bird of Fiji is a type of lorry, a, a parakeet, uh, called a kula. And the rest of the tribe thought it would be kula, in Omar's words, to name it twice. Uh, it would just sound like a, a better t- tribe name. So they went Kula Kula. But it is the National Bird of Fiji. A, Interesting. A parakeet of some Okay, I, I love these. Right, I'm, if I go play Survivor, I will have to make up something ridiculous at this point. Uh, make up something ridiculous? Like oh, I'm going to make up something. I'm not going to do research. I'm just like, oh, uh, this, is, this is the national something of, yeah, I don't know. Enel Adam. Enel Adam. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something a little bit more creative than that. but Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'm still my favorite is Merlonio. I mean, obviously the best is No Bag. What are you talking about? I mean, the best is No Bag, but I still love Merlonio because it's just it's the epitome of Redemption Island in one scene. Yeah, it's just Rob doing absolutely everything, and everyone be like, "Okay, that sounds right." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. exactly. That is mm-hmm. the whole thing. It is Redemption Island. Um, yeah, that I don't know. I still remember all the rule, like the, the rules of naming tr- merch. It's like it's like d- putting them together. <clears throat> uh, Guatemala, what? Nothing. That's bad. Like. Just saying the same thing twice is stupid. I don't know. Well, the lamest are when they just put the two. I mean, Guatemala. Exactly, which is why I called you out. That's the lamest is taking the two tribe names and just literally merging them. That's lame. Yeah. I don't know. So I guess it's decent um, as a name. Uh, We get high. We we go back to to camp. High is like, I'm running on fumes and memories of food. That's a good line. That that was a good line. talks about that he's excited to have some rice and that Chanel is the plan to go home. Mike wants his revenge. And then Hi goes to Chanel and says, it's Romeo. And Chanel does kind of what you're supposed to. Yeah. Which and acts relatively like calm. And Romeo is like, I guess Romeo wasn't filled in. And I guess it's partially maybe he wasn't filled in. Partially him just being paranoid, which in some ways is good and bad. Of like, why is Chanel calm? Yeah. Because I guess if he kn- if he was on Va- uh, Vati to start, and he knows the way sh- kind of sh- the the kind of player that Chanel is, I would be like Chanel's not normally this calm. When something's going on, she's not this calm. If you think of the uh, when she lost her vote, mm-hmm. the f- their first vote, she was nothing. But she was not calm at all. So I'd be like I'd be like she's oddly calm. Something's up. Mm-hmm. So I get that perspective, but I also get the did someone tell Romeo the plan? And if they told him the plan and said Chanel is the the real vote, but we've told her it's you, then I'd be like, 
I, I don't know. I think he jumped a little too much at that. Yeah, I, hard to. I mean, Roman's just in a bad position, so well, it feels like out of nowhere. Well, right, that's what we were saying. It's just I don't understand so, why he was dumped so quickly by Drea, but we dumped, and I feel like he's just digging his hole now, not getting any kind of foothold in with anyone socially. Yeah, no, not at all. And then like Drea's not talking, not talking to him, and he's like, Drea, why aren't you talking to me? She's like, I am talking to you. Who did he? Did he vote for Chanel? Was he? He, he, no, he, he voted he the high, high. No, high. Of course, he misspelled high. Right. Yes. Yeah, I also love the just the best. Like, there's there are not that many ways you could spell high. Like, I the way he did was funny. And then last week with Lindsay, I'm like, I get if you spelled it with an e or an a, fine. But like l y n z e, I'm like, that's I don't think that's how Lindsay's typically spelled. I've never well, seen it. I mean, I know some people do it on purpose. Uh, I'm not sure if either of you kept up with the last Australian Survivor season, but uh, yeah. Johnny and I did an interview with Sam, and even Jordy kept saying like it's spelled I E at the end, and uh, so and but she kept put only doing the I at the end, and so when we interviewed her, I asked her, I was like, was that on purpose? And she just smiled and was like, everything's deliberate. So, <laughs> yeah, wish I wish I could have been been a part of that interview but i i do love when the players are like deliberately spelling around that's funny but when they're just like so far off i'm like Whoa. well I'm like, it, it's funny but the returnee seasons is when you get me i feel like the um the survivor kismet gods are laughing because literally just now as we're talking about famous incorrectly handled names uh franny francesca franquesqua uh texted our group chain um so her name just, I, I smirked before because her name just popped up. And I was like, we're talking about mispronounced you, survivors. Can you here. please ask Francesca if she wants to come on the podcast? That would be a dream. I know. <laughs> I'm serious. I would love to. I think I reached out a while ago and got no response. I would, I love would to. be surprised. I don't think she's super into even, I don't think she's, honestly, I do not think she's watched the show in years. We like, we'll talk obviously in our chain. It's the one she's chain. We'll talk about the show, of course. And she is always just like, I have no idea. Um, I'm but whoever, get me whoever you, I'll talk to anyone about Sarah. This is great. Even if Francesca see none of it, I would just be like, Francesca, can you watch this one episode and give us your thoughts? She will be like, that's an hour too much of my time. I don't blame her. <laughs> that's <laughs> fair. I know she's very busy and successful. But like, I, oh, I would but love yeah, that. It was funny. I was like, oh, man, if you want to mispronounce name. I, I, I love that we've spent this time talking about Go, we st- we've talked about Gabon and Redemption Island more than I expected or would like to. Yeah, I yeah, didn't see those coming up today. <laughs> no, yeah. I didn't. Um, what else happened to this episode? Uh, Romeo talks to Tori about ha- hearing his name. Tori goes to Roxroy, Rox- or, and he goes to, and then goes to Omer, and they're all just like, all hell is breaking loose. Because Rome- like, They all see. I think it's so much of... How does he do a better job of hiding his paranoia? Because he just like looks like, oh my god, I'm losing my mind. Well, I, again, I feel like paranoia is the wrong word. Like, par- no, he wasn't. He wasn't par- paranoid. Is like think things that aren't happening are happening. The things he thought were happening were happening. He was annoying. He was handling it imp- improperly or poorly, but he wasn't paranoid. Well, he was like, no, my name is out there. What do I do? Like, but I, I think the reason I say paranoid is, I think initially it was like. It was out there, but it was out there as the very backup target. And if he does nothing, he probably, like, he, unless there's an idol, he's still in the game. I get that's not a comfortable position to be in. Not and I get all. trying to even, like, make yourself not the backup target. But what it seems like he did, especially when he talked to Omar, and I think Omar was like, he's going to play himself out of the game. And that's what it almost seemed like he did. He went from being like, I'm the backup. Oh, you know what? Now, now, you're, the fr- now you're the front target. And if Mike doesn't have his way, he might be gone because of his overplaying. So that's where I could say your paranoia may have gotten you. I just kind of saw it as, you know, maybe being a little bit overblown just because they were trying to do a last minute misdirect. I mean, I'm sure obviously all these things were said, but I think, you know, it was so clear for the longest time this episode, once Tori won immunity, oh, it's probably Chanel that maybe it was just, hey, let's put some of these extra scenes in here to maybe cause a little bit of doubt going into the vote. Uh, this one, I think, at least had a more of a shot in terms of like, I like not being a hundred percent sure who's going home. Where I was like, there were a couple episodes where like it is so a hundred percent this person, and then there's a little bit of a decoy. Like last week with Lydia, it was like Lydia's probably gone, um, but there's a shot. Like here, I felt like 
it was once you get Mike putting the kibosh on it, I think you're more likely that it's uh, Chanel going home. But like that little point in between, I'm like, maybe, maybe this is happening, which I'll take as something good. Um, and then I love that. Who does Mike go to when he wants his plan to go there? He goes to Roxbury and Jonathan, two of the least strategic people in this game. Yeah. It's like, which, yeah, but, but uh, I, yeah, I think you also go and you say, hey, this is who you vote for. And if they're locked in, I don't think you really have to do too much checking back in with them. It's okay. That's who they're voting for. Yep. And I guess high relents to Mike and they go to tribal. Um, Brian or Dan, anything interesting you found from tribal? Lindsay got a question. My my favorite Lindsay. Yes. Uh, the car metaphor, right? Yeah, that was exactly. The council. Yeah, I, I mean, it was maybe the first time I've heard Jeff get Dodo music. <laughs> Dodo music. It was. It was pretty close to Dodo music. I'm like, because he says at one point, he's like, it's all like a road trip, and it's about who can come on the trip, and then then he says. Uh, he's like, how do you know if you're in the right automobile? And the whole thing put together, he says automobile, and we get the music, and it's like, oh, God. Well, and it just seemed like he was trying to recreate, you know, the passengers' pilots from yeah, Edge of Extinction. Like, he's just like, I, this is what I want. <laughs> yeah, but he's like, automobile. Like, it's a car. And I think Marianne's like, it's a car, Jeff. Uh, Chanel's like, you're going to research and Marianne. And he's like, you could be fifth and be, like, dangling and not in the car. And then... Uh, I was like, that's, that's not how fifth works. <laughs> <laughs> but then Lindsay's, I like Lindsay. We get Lindsay's moment of she's like, well, it depends where you are at the game. Sometimes you want to be a driver, sometimes you want to be a passenger. And I'm just like, and Jeff is just like eating it up. And I'm like, and then oh, I no. like, put on your seatbelt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I can't throw stones from my glass house, but yeah, uh, that one, you know, Jeff loved that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um. Yeah, I guess the first time we get Dodo music from Jeff, I think ever. That's pretty good. I didn't, I didn't catch that. Uh, right? Yeah. Like, Dan, am, I, am I on face here? I can't remember another time where that's happened. But you, you say we would say this time it felt like Dodo music. It didn't feel like complete Dodo music, like. But it felt like we're making fun of Jeff here. Yeah, it definitely felt like you know the editors were like, "How can we poke a little bit of fun at him, but without being it." overly like blatantly obvious he has a say in it doesn't he as an executive producer shouldn't he get like final say of the the cut there so well, i think that's why you had to just you know lightly drizzle it in there he's like this go. is funny okay this is funny yeah maybe he's got some sense of humor about himself yeah. maybe maybe he's evolved i don't know uh, i don't know he's evolved in some ways i don't know if they're all the good ways but uh hi talks about the driver must know when to let other people drive Hi, that's a lot coming from you. Because Hi to me seems like the person so far who has been like, I am driving no one else's. Like he's wanted that power. I think, I think he's the person that just keeps, he's relinquished the most power from that group of eight I, since it formed. Now well, seven. yeah, he has because he lost Lydia and he lost this vote where he wanted Romeo. I mean, he's losing it. Okay, I'm giving you that. And he's like kind of giving them what they want. But I almost feel like, and to give this more of a driver passenger analogy, I still feel like he's in the driver's seat. And the others are saying, let him drive. He's like, no, tell me where you want to go. I'll go wherever, but I'm driving. But I just, and I think he's like, I, I don't up know like, about that because he's not like, obviously we're getting to the point where this, you know, large Alliance is going to have to blow up and where's his sub Alliance. Mm -hmm. He's I pretty much lost everyone that would be in a sub Alliance. He I mean, he's just voted out two people from his own tribe. He yeah. has. I agree with you there. But I still think the perception of him is that he's still running things. Or that he's still trying to control things. Even if he's not getting his way. He like if you he's look in at, the mix. He's who there. are the power players? Who are the ones driving the action? I still think high is almost your number one choice. Hard to not think Omar is the number yeah, one. Omar is there, but Omar. I think Omar's doing a better job of hiding it. Hiding it from the other players, potentially. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's that's where I'm getting at. He's not getting his way as much as Omar is, but I definitely think he's perceived like perception is reality. We say, and I still think the perception of high is that he is like a power player. I guess maybe, but then again, if That's I'm right. Jonathan or if I'm Lindsay or if I'm Omar or if I'm uh, Mike, maybe not Mike, if I'm the three Taku people, I'm like, I mean, we just got this guy to vote out two of his own tribe members. So 
Yeah, and it almost seems like it's a decision, like when they're going through, it's a Taku that's, you know, figuring out who's going to go. It's almost like they're talking more with Mike about where the decision is going to be made than it is with High, from what we've seen anyway. And next episode, well, next episode, it shows Jonathan talking to Rox Roy and Mike about an all male alliance. So, Shocker. Um, yeah. That would include high and Romeo suddenly no longer on the bottom, I suppose. And then who's the sixth? Oh, Omar. Yeah. Yeah. I and, think the only good news for that is the fact that they brought it up and that it's going to two different tribals. Is I feel pretty confident that's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think the three of them might work together. I don't think you get more than that. Um, but we get the votes. It's high spelled wrong. Romeo, Chanel, Romeo, Chanel, Romeo, and Chanel five times. And so seven, seven of. Three to one, uh, we lose. Romeo also high loses his perfect game. Why would high tell anyone? Why would anyone tell anyone that they want a perfect game? I don't care. Like, sure, I can dream of it, but I'm shutting up about that. Like, I mean, maybe maybe Chanel was just picking up on that. I again, she just said it in an interview. Who knows? But like um, he would have had to say it, other than like, yeah. yeah but it know. also could have been a from a conversation that happened post game. Yeah. Sure. Also, we yeah we haven't gotten Ponderosa. I don't know why. Oh yeah, watching? Ponderosa videos, right? So um, I haven't heard. I don't know. It could have been a COVID thing, uh, but they did it for season forty-one. Yeah, maybe they had trouble. Maybe like forty-one. I don't know. Maybe maybe something happened with forty-one. I didn't watch the Ponderosa forty-one. I didn't like love the forty-one cast. If I'm being totally honest, I mean there were high points, no doubt. But I like I wasn't compelled to want to watch more about them after they were going to know. Yeah. Um, I. Could have sworn I heard, you know, someone tweet or an article that because like with COVID going on or whatever, that the crew that generally does Ponderosa went home with like the season 41 cast. Oh, okay. I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but I know I read that somewhere. I really hope not. I, I hope these players don't get deprived of Ponderosas. I mean, like some of them were so good last year. Like getting Tiffany. Tiffany's well, alone. She was like Tiffany, teaching. Tiffany's a great one. Well, uh, Chanel has already come out and said that there's no Ponderosa videos for this season. Oh, okay. Great. Filming it themselves, do Blair Witch style. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just like I'm alone in Ponderosa. I just want to see their inter interactions with the others. And also, you know what we get robbed of now? We get robbed of Tori and Roxory interacting in Ponderosa. That's uh, all I want. Or maybe that's why they deleted the Ponderosa video. Or they never make it to Ponderosa. Oh, stop. No, they wouldn't delete it. Yeah. That would be gold. Unless they literally punch each other in the face, that's gold. And maybe <laughs> even then it's gold. Around. Yeah. And I don't think either of them are doing it. Like, no, it's gold. There's no reason you cut it um, or delete yeah. it. Like, I, maybe I they would both imagine make it to the end. It would probably be something COVID related. I would. That think. makes sense. I doubt it's a big enough budget item for them to even worth being cut. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Chanel talks about how she should have seen this coming. And the four people in the minority were the four people you'd expect. Marianne, Omar, and Chanel vote for Romeo. Romeo votes for High. All the others vote for Chanel. And there you have it. Do we expect Omar to be? Oh, there? sorry. You don't expect Omar. My bad. Um, so wait, Omar, the votes, it was uh, Marianne, Omar. And Chanel voted for Romeo. For Romeo. Right. Makes sense. Okay. And then Romeo voted for, I was looking at my notes and like, I saw the names. I'm like, wait, that's, oh, wait. I can't I remember when, when did, uh, someone has a question about Guatemala. When, um, when was Marianne looking shocked? Was she looking shocked this week or last week? No, she voted for Lydia last week, so she couldn't have been looking yeah. So Mary, they were going to of Marianne looking yeah. really surprised, right? She was at, wait, she, yeah, I think, yeah, she was surprised. It's, was it? I think she was surprised at it being Chanel. I, I feel like I remember seeing her looking like, wait, what? I think she was expecting to be Romeo. Yeah, I think she looked back, you know, looking yeah. shocked as uh, the Chanel votes kind of came piling in. For sure. Also, did we catch this week how Chanel was like, they're playing chess. They're, they're playing, playing chess, chess. I'm playing no, they're, they're playing checkers. I'm playing chess. But she said it right after she was like, I mean, I was totally blindsided. Turns out they're playing checkers and I'm playing chess. It's like, that's, yeah. that's not how that analogy works. Unless she just meant to say, like, we're playing two different games. But obviously, mm -hmm. that particular analogy is just to say, I'm playing a more sophisticated game. game. Well, I think that's the second time where, you know, she's had a 
off confessional. Obviously there was that one. And then from the one episode where Jenny goes home, where they go to rocks, it was, she's like, I'm so good at this game. I can control it even without a vote. And it's like, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, someone asked, uh, did you guys have any idea that they were going to be returning players for the season? For, so for Guatemala. So um, <clears throat> for our pregame in Guatemala, we had, you know, we, you're, you're at the location a full week almost before filming begins. So we were down there and we could see everyone else who was in the game, except obviously, Stephanie and Bobby John were nowhere to be seen. We did not know they were going to be returning players. It had never happened before Guatemala. So Guatemala is the first season that has that captain's theme. Obviously, yeah. All-Stars had all returning players, but there was no reason to have any precedent for a mixed cast. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that would have been a little bit weird, but I honestly don't think any of us really picked up on it, was there were only 16 of us in the pregame stuff. So it was eight men, eight women. And the previous few seasons Vanuatu and Palau and even All-Stars had had 18 to 20 people so if any of us I guess really noticed the oddity it would have been that there were only 16 people instead of the the new normal of 18 to 20 but the difference between and I think people forget this the difference between uh Pearl Islands and Guatemala was only two years so it's not like this larger cast had been long established and 16 would be super weird and of course, a few seasons in the future, China ends up being just 16 people. But so no, long-winded yeah. answer to your question. We had no idea that we're going to be returning players. And even the 16 players wasn't that weird at that point. All right. Well, Brian, I know you're you're on a bit of a time limit. We've probably yeah, I was, gone I was over like, that. oh, it's four. And I just saw my boss come back from lunch. And I'm like, eh, I should probably get back to work. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, last couple of questions for you. Who's going home next and who's winning? The game. Oh God! Who's going home next? Well, I think I think uh, if Tori doesn't win immunity, she's out. Uh, Tor she does. Well, we we have two people going home, so pick yeah, two people. Two, right? So I would say, I would say Tori and Romeo seem like the obvious candidates for that. Okay. And then if one of them wins immunity, got all these idols. I'm like, Marianne's got an idol, but it can be stolen from Drea. Like, I, um, Tori and romeo and i still think backup probably is marianne okay and who's who's your winner pick at this point uh omar okay i agree with you there uh Two really quick row, right? that's the pick yeah really quick what were the rules for the ruins there in guatemala if you had oh you um in guatemala the ruins so i was on yasha we did not get the ruins camp which ps turned out to be the way better camp um so the you know reward for winning that 11 12 mile hike uh in the first episode was to have the the better camp it was better only from an aesthetic standpoint better for viewers because it was not as shaded over at the nakun camp they were more out in the open with the blazing sun we had more of a canopy over at yasha we were more ensconced inside the woods and the the major difference was our walk to the water was just a few hundred yards their walk to the water was much much farther so mm -hmm. that was a huge difference between the two camps. So despite us not having ruins at Yasha, so we weren't beholden to any rules that you're asking about. Um, on the other side, uh, I mean, I don't think there were any major rules. I, I'm pretty sure you weren't supposed to go to the bathroom on them. But as you saw on TV, people are constantly lounging on them, sitting on them, getting their yep. gross human oils all over these beautiful ancient temples. But say I'm okay. pretty sure Judd opened a beer on one. So yeah, I mean, it was just not uh, not not super strict. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Brian, thank you so much. Thank you so so much for your time for coming. Um, it's this has been a blast. Talk to you this episode with three. Talk through this episode with you. Um, good luck with all the SA two tutoring. Thank you guys. Uh, God and enjoy the rest of the season. And Sam, I agree. In your question, you say you're interested in seasons that are not tropical islands. I agree. Let's get on Fiji. Uh, I know they get so much money to be in yeah. Fiji, blah, blah, blah. We, but yeah, let's let's return to a non-tropical environment. We, um, you, are the, you are the best, Brian. Good luck with that. And then thanks, one, on the other side, Dan Thank and you. I will be back for some readings. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. See you. Lucy Nicotine is a company founded by Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for a better and cleaner nicotine alternative. Finally, tobacco alternatives that don't suck. Researched and developed for three years to be made for people, not patients. 
Lucy has created a nicotine gum with four milligrams of nicotine that comes in three flavors, wintergreen, cinnamon, and pomegranate. Lucy also has a lozenge with four milligrams of nicotine in cherry ice flavor. Each and every flavor actually tastes great and it's convenient and discreet. Products can be enjoyed anywhere on flights, at work, on the go, or even in the gym. I am so happy that Lucy is sponsoring us. Ever since they came on board, I have gotten no less than five of my friends transitioned over to Lucy and put their cigarettes down. They like the gum. I'm used to seeing the packages all around. This stuff is great, and it's really helping people make much healthier choices. So get on board and join the Lucy movement. Hey, it's 2021. Get rid of your cigarettes, unplug your vape, throw out your dip, and get some Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. This is the real deal. A subscription to Lucy comes directly to your door each month. It's so simple that you don't even have to leave your house because Lucy has delivery down. Reality NSFW listeners, go to lucy.co and use promo code SURVIVOR to get 20% off all products, including gum or lozenges. That's lucy.co and use promo code SURVIVOR at checkout. Also, I have to give this disclaimer. Warning, this product contains nicotine derived from tobacco. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. That's lucy.co and be sure to use that promo code survivor this episode of reality nsfw is sponsored by blue chew say it with us blue chew blue chew is making waves and bringing more confidence to the bedroom by offering chewable tablets that can help men get stronger and longer lasting erections that's right we're giving away super hard dicks Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Blue Chew's tablets help men achieve harder, stronger erections to combat all forms of ED. Blue Chew is an online prescription service, so no visits to the doctor offices, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. And it ships right to your door in a discreet package. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And the best part, it's all done online. Blue Chew's licensed medical providers work with you to find the right ingredient and strength for your prescription. Don't like swallowing pills? No problem here. Blue Chew's Sildenafil and Tadalafil tablets are chewable. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and they prepare and ship direct, so it's cheaper than a pharmacy. Hey, if you're looking to give that immunity idol to someone or you don't want to be voted out of a crater, don't worry. Blue Chew's got you covered. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use promo code SURVIVOR at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's Blue Chew, B-L-U-E-C-H-E-W dot com, promo code SURVIVOR to receive your first month free. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. We're all trying to eat better, but healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Magic Spoon has the amazing flavors you love, but without all the bad stuff. And it's amazing as a midnight snack right before bed. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. That's only 140 calories per serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. And build your own box. Available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon, cookies and cream, and my favorite, maple waffle. Now, Magic Spoon recently brought back their two super popular flavors, cookies and cream and maple waffle. Thank goodness. But they're back permanently. And when these flavors were first introduced for a limited time, they sold out extremely quickly. Now, I'm here to let you know you can get them again or try them for the first time. Why? Because they're delicious and indulgent. 
Johnny, Magic Spoon has so many great flavors that I really enjoy, and even my kids enjoy them. We have the cocoa, fruity frosted, peanut butter. All these are really great combinations. Um, they enjoy waking up in the morning and getting some Magic Spoon right off to start their day great before they head off to school. I think everybody listening should give Magic Spoon a try, or if you've tried them already, it's time to reorder. Let's get you some more Magic Spoon and uh, get your day started right. Hey, when I finish a podcast late at night, the first thing I'm thinking is not sleep. It's let me grab a delicious bowl of Magic Spoon before I go to bed. So go to magicspoon.com forward slash survivor to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code survivor at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash survivor and use the code SURVIVOR to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this podcast. All right. Dan, are you ready to rate our final 10? Yeah, it is 10. Yeah, and I guess, you know, real quick, since we just finished up with the ads, I can go ahead and say, if you're interested in watching Survivor live this week at a viewing party with Johnny Fairplay, if you are in the Durham, North Carolina area, this is going to be the time and place to do it. So it's going to be this Wednesday, 427 at the Dirty Bull Brewing Company in Durham, North Carolina. Not only is Johnny going to be there, the queen, Sandra Diaz Twine, will be there, as well as contestants from what? It's Philippines. We have Zane Knight and Dana. Dana, I apologize. Blank name, your last name right now. Lambert. There you go. As well as Jane Bright. I will be there as long as that's, that's the big get everyone. Dan will be there. I'm serious. As go, well go as I, be, I believe two of our friends will be there as well from Survivor Ladies Night. Lauren Pratt and Sarah Hart should also be there. Oh, no. So I this believe is... we are going to have a great showing and a great time at what looks to be a great episode. You're breaking my heart. All the podcasters are going to be there but me. Uh, it breaks my heart. But Lauren didn't. She was kind of a last minute. So regardless, I'm still sad. I want to meet all you guys and I haven't met anybody on um, this sucks. But uh, speaking of viewing parties, I know Johnny's doing one in New Jersey. I believe May 11th is the date. I will. Or is it the 18th? It's one or the other. Um, I believe I'll it's look... the 18th. It's because I think it's the week before. I think it's the penultimate episode. Yes. May 18th uh, in New Jersey. I will likely be there. Um, and Bryce and Wendell will be there, obviously. And whoever else they get. Um, I think Sandra was on. Don't don't quote me on Sandra, but I believe she was on the initial promo. But I know definitely Bryson Wendell will be there. Yeah, I know that much. We'll see who comes. Um, but yeah, if you want to watch Survivor with me and talk my ear off all night, I will gladly do the same back to whoever it is. I don't care if I don't know you. Um, just be a nice, decent human being, and we can talk all night about Survivor or many other things. Um, but now are you ready to rate these players, Dan? Let's do it. All right. Let's. Oh wait, no, that's not how I do it. Okay, there we go. Uh, do, 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 do our final ten. Here we go. And now that we don't have really tribes or anything, and we're actually in works group, I figured let's go alphabetically. Start with Dre. Uh, Dan, what do you have for Dre? So as of right now, she's obviously in an amazing spot. I think you know. Tony's bag of tricks needs to be Drea's bag of tricks, you know, bag of goodies, because she's got one of everything. My Literally. only concern with her is that if it ends up blowing in her face, which I could see happening, but right now I can't help but be impressed with everything that she has done thus far. She has all these, you know, advantages. She is in the tight alliance. And I think if need be, she could go back to people like Romeo and potentially pull that in. Or as you know, we may see two travels of five. She could even potentially work with Tori as well. So I think I'm going to give her the same rating as last time at an eight. Uh, but I definitely think that as of right now, her arrow could be pointing higher in weeks to come. All right, you had, I thought you had her seven last week. All right. Maybe um, I did. I think Maybe did. I did because I knocked her one point. So just kidding. She's up to an eight. All right. Well, she also goes up to an eight for me. Um, she's got everything. 
literally one of everything. Uh, still, maybe a bit too much, too too much overplaying sometimes. A little too much talking. Uh, she's in a good spot. Got an idol. I still don't love the Romeo move and kind of getting uh him off to the side, but see, yeah, that's why I'm hoping she can bring Romeo back in when she decides that you know she wants to make a move to maybe take out someone in the larger alliance. And with all of her, as Sam said in the comments, she's Survivor Rich, has the tools to do so. She absolutely is Survivor Rich. Um, and yes, next up is good old Hi. Another person very much in this vote, very much in the episode as a whole. Um, let me start with Hi. I gave Hi a six last week. Um, uh, I... I, I, I I think I'm at a five. I don't know where I'm at with high because in some ways he's obviously cares about having agency. And I like that. Like he's trying to make moves, but they're not working. His plans are not going anywhere right now. Um, he's still in a big group, which gives me reason to think he'll have some staying power, but he is a player that I think if he gets screwed next week and is not put with the right people, they might get rid of him. There's a chance he goes next week. Uh, I don't feel like he's completely safe anymore. Um, his, I guess, a little bit of pettiness sometimes. It, that the not 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 pettiness, as Brian wants to say, I think could bite him in the ass. Uh, so I don't love everything he's doing. I'm out of five right now. I hope he goes back up and shows me the player that he can be. Yeah, I maybe it's because I've been high on him all season. I'm not willing to give out hope yet. I think he's at a six, but I think next I, vote is going to be a make or break for high. I think, I mean, hopefully he doesn't go home, but regardless, I think the way that the votes go next week is going to be make or break for high. So either he's going to be on the upswing or the downswing, but for now I'll have him at a six. Yeah. You, you're keeping him at a six. I couldn't, after this episode, I still felt the need to bring him down one with the caveat that if he stays, he's probably going back up. Mm-hmm. He's towing that line for me. Um, I still think he has a lot of potential as a player. Um, don't know how well he can execute, but we'll see. I'm really curious to see how him and Mike get along. I'm really curious to see how that him and Mike and him and Romeo. But next up is neither of those guys. It's Jonathan. Uh, two challenges that he hasn't won. That he this one he wasn't brought up at all. I get color be impressed. Um, yeah, he's made some good connections, and maybe I'm reading too much into it, but the past few episodes, you know, when it comes to the challenges and Jonathan starts getting that music, that makes me think that as much as Jeff loves them, they're not doing all these type of subtle things for someone who's going to be voted out ninth. I think he's going to be around. I wouldn't be shocked to see him in the last few episodes. I, I'm starting to think he could be playing a little bit like the Danny McCray game of be big and physical and strong. Obviously not. I don't like to the level that Danny played it at be big, physical, strong, but be likable, not win everything. And then he slightly flies under the radar, even though he's a gigantic target. Um, yeah. I almost, I almost want to bump him from a four last week, but I giving him and high the his same score doesn't feel right. I'm going to keep him at a four. Um, but yeah, still a big target. I don't still don't see him winning, but the fact that he's not winning every challenge may be helping him. Dan, what? Yeah, what I think it's helping him. That's why, like I said, is I could see. I still don't necessarily see his path to winning the game, but I see his path to surviving uh, a lot longer because I don't think it's been shown that it's very rare that you can win out, like win all these challenges and that solely alone is the reason that you win. Uh, I'll be a little bit higher. I have him at a five. I, like I said, I have a gut feeling that he's going to be around for a little bit longer than what we initially expected him to be, you know, as of a few episodes ago. Very fair. Very fair. We'll see what happens. I'm curious. Jonathan's interested me, whereas before I didn't think I would have any interest in a guy like him. Next up is a person I'm also interested in and, uh, we'll probably continue giving a five two unless I get some other reason. I mean, I'm thinking about bumping over to six, but I'll probably stay five, right? What about you? same thing, Dan? 
Well, now that Brian's not here, Lindsay is in fact a contestant on Survivor season four. I, I think I don't think he would mind that. I think he he would agree. That is, I think she's doing some things well if you're really paying attention to it. But as it's been pretty much this entire season, I don't have anything negative to say about her other than you know we're not seeing anything of her but i don't think she's doing anything wrong she's good in challenges i i'd almost i feel pretty confident that she's going to win a challenge if she continues to stick around like she's going to win an individual immunity uh so yeah i'm going to stay incredibly consistent on her and keep her at a five all right I'm debating whether because I'm looking at it and I'm like I have her and high at the same score right now. I'm thinking I'm actually gonna go to a six on her because now the later we get in the game, she's still purple. She's still really likable and her name's on either. There's a small chance she wins, so I'm gonna jump on that trainer like just in case. Um, not jinxing her because I'm not saying that she will win the game. I'm just saying there's a small chance. Um, yeah. But watch her, watch her go home next week. That also could happen. Um, she'd be like, we always get like a random boot sometimes in the doubles, and I think she could be it. But next up is somebody who's very not random. It's Marianne. What do you have for Marianne, Dan? I love Marianne. Same. But I I'm worried about her, especially now with Dre having that knowledge is power, because if she's going to steal something, my biggest prediction would be that it would be Marianne's idol. She's still kind of finding herself in the minority. I have her at a four. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, not willing to completely bump her down all the way because I think I don't think it'd be out of the question as they keep picking off, you know, from these other tribes rather than the Taku, that maybe at some point they say, Hey, you know, the four of us are still here, especially if they all survive the next vote. That's still half. That'd be half the cast. That would be that me. would be something. So, I don't, yeah, I'll go four. Okay, uh, I've we both dropped her one, so now I'm down to a three on Mary. As much as that breaks my heart, she's in the minority. Her social game is decent. It's good and really good for some people. It's really awful for other people. Um, and now Dre could steal her idol. Everyone, almost everyone knows about. A lot of people know about the idol, and now the fact that it can just be stolen with Dre just asking for it is horrible for her game. Mm -hmm. Really horrible now that she has like almost no safety net because Dre can just ask for it when she wants to vote out uh, Marianne. Uh, can she win? Maybe. It, it, probably not. Um, Marianne's going home soon. I'm sorry. She is. Uh, I, it pains me. I hope she can bounce back from this, but I'm at a three. Regrettably. Next up. Is it got another guy I love, and that's Mike. And Mike's score is going to take a bit of a nosedive for me. And I say a bit because he was at a seven last week. Uh, yeah, I'll say six. I almost went down to a five. Uh, I really didn't like the vindictiveness of getting rid of Chanel, but he got his way. He still got what he wanted. He's got people that will back him up. And he could win this game, actually. Um, he yeah, got his way, and it's a way that it didn't really burn anyone else that's left in the game. Maybe, you know, it would Maybe hurt. high. Maybe high. Maybe, maybe, but where else is high turning to? I don't think he really has too much of a choice right now. Because but, if he, we go, oh, okay, let's get rid of Mike, too, then it's just, I think that only continues to self-destruct his game. I'll also have Mike at a six. I don't think, you know, he's in this fantastic position, but as of right now, I think he's in a really good spot. Yeah. Um, I Well, it starts with high, high and saying, oh, high has nowhere to go. But high would seems like a player that he would try to figure out somewhere to go. And high almost could be that vindictive of, oh, I'm mad at Mike. I'm There's no way I'm working with Mike, even though it sinks my own game. I think he's better than that, but there is a chance. So my biggest concern with High, I, I know we're past him, but just uh, bringing him up is the fact that I don't think it did him well being part of the reason that Lydia went home and writing her name down because that's you know that just shows as you get late in the game, it's who can I trust and someone who's willing to vote out someone that they went to rocks for earlier in the game. Yeah, it's 
Not great. Yeah. yeah. Not great, but someone who is great and is still playing the best game, in my opinion, is good old Omar. Uh, Dan, where's Omar? Is he your highest score? He's going to share it with Dre at eight. I'd okay, say, you know, if you're fair. doing it, he's... I don't think it's one and two. I think he's one A. Dre is, you know, one B. But okay. I think right now he is playing the best game. I don't – I mean, once you go to nine and ten, like you're talking like pretty confident. I think he has the ability in the next few episodes to go to, you know, a nine or a ten, which I don't believe I've ever given anyone. But – I don't think you have. And maybe what you, you wanted to give Daniel one. I remember you almost gave Daniel a ten. I, no, that, that I said it. I went high. It was not that high. You went uh, pretty high, and I you you wanted to go higher. I know you did, but I didn't. Uh, but yeah, I think what I'm interested to see with him is because he's still kind of playing that middle ground where you know he has good relationships with everyone. If he can turn that into more of an asset down the road, where he can maybe flip things around more in his favor, I think it's a good thing. I could also see it being him getting blindsided somewhere, but I, yeah, I have him at a high eight right now. I think he's uh, playing the best game so far. Once again, we're in unison. Uh, I have Omar at an eight as well. His game is fantastic. This is really good. Again, I worry about staying power. How long can he keep this up? If he keeps this up, the rest of the merger wins this game. It's one of the better winning games we've ever seen. And I will say that. Um, can he keep that up? I don't know. It's just such a, it's such a good position to be in that it is hard for me to see him keeping up, but I would mm -hmm. love to see him do it. And yeah, it's really hard run. to dominate. I mean, forget start to finish, but you know, once the merge phase happens the whole way through, like that's, it's almost unheard of at this point. Absolutely. Um, but Elmer could, could Elmer do it? Yeah. If I'm looking at winner candidates, he's up there and that's partially based on the scores. Like I see, Right now, him, Drea, Mike. I can't believe I'm even saying Mike in this. And then outside shot of Lindsay. I think that's it. And we'll, we can talk about this when we get to the end. But like, out of 10 people, I really only see three of them winning. That's shocking. Um, it's like that I've, I've really ruled out other people. We'll see. One of the people I've ruled out is Rock Troy. <laughs> and I think I ruled him out episode one. Oh, mm. uh, yeah. Rock Troy. I, no shot in hell. He's got no shot of winning this game. Uh, again, he's still got allies, I think. In a great so, spot. Uh, no. How, how, the real question is just how low are you going? Uh, ooh. Ooh. I don't know. Because gave Marianne a three. Because I think Marianne's more of a target to go home. I think I'm going to keep him at a three, but for almost different reasons of he just has no shot of winning. Actually, mm, he has no shot of winning. There is no way. No, two. He has literally no shot of winning. The only reason he's not getting a one is because he's not 100% on the target list to go home. But with these tribes being the way they are, we don't know. So I'm going to go with the two. There's not much good from Rock, sorry. He's loyal. I That's it. Uh, yeah, I have him at a three. I don't think he necessarily has a shot at winning, but I could see... I'm on two different ends. I wouldn't be shocked with, you know, how it would break down if he went home next week. But I also wouldn't be surprised if someone took him along just being like, hey, we don't have to worry about him going rogue. Well, he say that, but he voted for Lindsay two votes ago. Uh <laughs> yeah, what is, that, that's where you get I get it with Rock Story. He's loyal. Okay. But is he going to be a follower? No, it almost seems like I'm loyal. I'll vote. With, I'm not going to vote for you, but I'm voting for whoever the hell I want. I'm going to stick with the begrudgingly three. Okay. And the reason I give Rox for a, a begrudging uh, a two is because I can't justify giving him and Romeo the same score. Uh, I'm giving Romeo a three. Uh, I feel like. And yes, he's more likely to go home than Rox Roy. But is he overall, I think, a more capable player? And can I can I see a universe where Romeo gets out of this? Yes. Is it like is it likely? No way in hell. Um, but there's a chance. These two tribes of five can help him. There's a chance he gets out of this. He's shown that he's socially um, 
capable. He's strategically capable to an extent. He didn't go home this week. Um, was aware enough of the fact that his name was being thrown out there. So, but he played it badly, and he's in a bad spot. So it's a three, and yeah, second lowest score tied with Marianne. So not much praise for Oxroy. I I have a Romeo to uh, three not, as well. Not much he praise took, for Romeo, uh, thank you. Obviously took a hit with the way this went, and it's just curious to see is, you know, he got this paranoid player edit. Is, is this, you know, the wake-up call that's his turnaround, or is this just what, inev- you know, inevitably does him in? Uh, so I have him at a three. Okay. And the last person is not least. She won immunity again. That's Tori. Why, where are you at with Tori, Dan? Two. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing She's, else. Just two. I mean, her her only right. chance is to keep winning. And I think if she can survive this and go down to eight, I could see her sticking around for – a little bit just because once you get to eight, you know, that seven, eight range, it's where players start to become more, you know, realizing, Hey, we got to take out some of the bigger threats in the game and Tori isn't it. So she could be around for a while, but two zero shot at winning this game. Okay. Uh, I'm at, yep. I'm at a two as well. Uh, she's not winning this game. I'm with you. Uh, I'm looking at the people I've given the lowest score to. Uh, Tori's not winning this game. I gave her a two. Roxroy really isn't winning this game. I'll give him a two. Uh, and who else can't really win this game? It's like Romeo, an outside shot. Uh, Marianne, an outside shot. Jonathan's the only other one I could say isn't winning this game. So those are three, and they're three of the low, five lowest scores. Um, which I think pretty much makes sense. It's three of the lowest scores and two of the ju- biggest targets in this game. Uh, yeah. I love Tori from an entertainment perspective. If you gave me entertainment, I'm probably giving her a nine. But in terms of the gameplay... She's winning immunity. That's impressive. Nothing else really is. Um, actually, no. That and the fact that she's aware of so many things and thinking, in some cases, many steps ahead. The way she carries out everything is pretty much bad, though. Um, yeah. So that's really yeah, where she's, I'm at. I, I hope she continues to stick, or, stick around because I think she'll continue to cause chaos. And as much as people may not like that, it is good for the show. Oh, it's good for the show. And that's also why I want Romeo in the game. I think from a gameplay perspective, he causes chaos. Um, but if I'm looking at this now, I think we're, we're at 10 people. We're almost halfway through the cast. Um, and we'll be at eight next week. So there's really no halfway point. Uh, I'm looking at who can win this game. And I'm like looking down my list and I say, I, strong contenders, Drea, Omar, and probably Mike. And then like an outside shot of Lindsay, an outside shot of high. And I stop there. Yeah, anyone I, I missed or any order you would change? I don't think Lindsay's there just because Lindsay's like a very far fourth though. Like she's say not... what you want, say what you want, you know about all the twists and advantages, and she has an amulet. She well, has something. Oh. Well, yes, but I mean, say what what you want about all that, and obviously a lot. It's a lot of the same ones from forty one. But it seems like the way that they've edited it has been different. And I don't think they give us a second winner in a row that was purple invisible for almost well, the entire game. Do you want to know what, what the only reason I think I could say that is that they just in some cases don't know how to edit a female winner? And it could be. Not- the only thing that I will say is I know I heard I heard this. I think it was in the off season is and I can't speak to the credibility of it because obviously you know i'm not the one that's speaking to production wish i was but that's not the case is i've heard i heard them say that as a whole they were down on 41 but they loved 42 and i don't think a Lindsay win is what would make them love 42 i swear to god if jonathan wins I don't think it's a Jonathan win. I, I don't, don't either, but I, it's that a would production make... loved it, not Jeff. Well, Jeff is part of it, a big part of it. Um, and I assume he would hire people that also have the same wet dreams that he does, and maybe in some cases. But yeah, my my, my, my my number one pick is Omar. It'd probably go Omar one, Drea two, Mike three, a big drop. And then I, I still think Lindsay at four because I just can't think of anybody else. Maybe high. I, could I put think I'd almost forward. break it up into tiers. Like I yeah. think you'd have a tier one that would be Omar and Drea. I agree. 
and then a drop off. So that's where you could put, you know, your mic, your high, and even uh, your Lindsay. Interesting. And then okay. I think it's a pretty significant drop off after that. Yeah, maybe next week I'll get a tier maker. We can actually make tiers. But um, really quickly, yeah, I'd I'd go Omar Omar one A, Dre one B. I would put another tier, and I would just put Mike in that tier. That's fair. And then I would put Lindsay. I'd put high. And, and then I think you'd have to do a separate tier before it, you got to the other. I'd probably do another tier, and then I'd probably put Jonathan and Marianne in there. And then I leave. Actually, Jonathan, Marianne, and Romeo in some order. Then I put Roxanne and Tori at the bottom. That's probably my order. That's fair. Um, we'll see who wins. Uh, yeah, I'm starting to feel more strongly about Omar, but who knows? Who knows? We'll see. Uh, I'm looking forward to this double episode, even if I don't love the twist they always do, because it's going to screw somebody. I'm just hoping that these alignments are interesting mm-hmm. and that they can fill f- 42 minutes and fill it appropriately and not just give us really rushed tribals or really drawn out episodes. We'll see. I hope they can fill it up decently. So if they can, we're in for a good episode next week. Absolutely. I, right. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, all right. So we already talked about the viewing parties. Uh, Dan, you want to tell our good listeners what else is happening on Reality NSFW? Yes. So if you love what we're doing here at Reality NSFW, the best way is to become a patron, supports the podcast. You can do that at adfreensfw.com. That gets you access to our secret Facebook patron group where, you know, there's generally a ton of discussion going around. It gets you some added uh, bonus content. One thing is every week we usually get a Q&A, that is Matt and Johnny, where you can ask them anything and everything you'd want. And trust me, they will answer it. Oh, they will answer anything. <laughs> the other thing that you get is, so they're going through and watching past seasons of Australian Survivor. Right now they're going through 2019. So that's one of the better seasons out there. I believe they just hit the merge. So they're going through that. Johnny may know some of it, but I know Matt has never watched it and is watching one episode a week. So you are still getting true, authentic reactions, not knowing the outcome of it. And so you get, on top of that, you get the links to, you know, to watch all the episodes if you don't have them anywhere else. And if you join, you can go back. And if you want to watch any of this past season of Australian Blood versus Water, uh, all the links for that are provided as well. Uh, speaking of blood versus water, the season is over, but we haven't stopped interviewing contestants. I believe it was Tuesday. Johnny and I uh, did a post game interview with Jesse. Uh, we're looking at trying to get hopefully one or two before we wrap up the season. But for more content, you're getting the live reaction recap show right after the episode. Uh, when Johnny's around, you get him, Matt. And Alex Triaz, uh, with Johnny being at the viewing party, you're probably looking at Matt and Alex Triaz and potentially someone else, you know, will join in. Uh, For even more additional Survivor content, you have the Survivor Ladies Night podcast, which shows up at, usually it's Mondays at 8 o'clock with Lauren and Sarah. They they put in the group. Do you know who their guest is this week? They have they do I do know they have Sydney from season 41. That's right. We just spoke to her a few weeks yeah. ago. So they have Sydney on. She is and awesome. I'm sure you will get another great interview from her. As well as if you're keeping up with this season of Big Brother Canada, uh Brent and um uh, oh Brent and Bobby. Bobby, yeah. Why am I blanking? Apologize. Brent and Bobby <laughs> go live every Wednesday to discuss that as well. And then, as always, Alex and I will be back next week, yes. hopefully with another great guest to bring hopefully. you. And just like I said, you know, support the channel. If you become a patron, that's great. If not, make sure to like and subscribe. You'll get notifications to every episode, and uh, you'll see all the great content we're putting out here at Reality NSFW. All right. And for those of you in Durham, North Carolina that next week, obviously as far as a great, go give Dan some love. Um, he deserves it. He's awesome. And I wish I could be there. Uh, but gi- give Dan, give Dan a big hug for me, all of you. Um, and yeah, have fun next week, Dan. That, Thank and, you. Yeah, looking forward to talking to you next week. All Absolutely. Right. Thank you everyone so much for listening. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. And for more Reality NSFW content, visit adfreenSFW.com.